Well, friends, here we are again, back in the saddle, off limits, trying to cover some deep to topics that we don't always like to cover in the life of the church. And so I'm grateful for the, the amazing feedback we got last week. I, I was just pleasantly overwhelmed uh, in a very positive way of your feedback, not just about the message, but the concept of this worship series and the ways in which it's helping challenge us, stretch us. And of course, all of that helps to lead to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. So thanks for being a part of that. Also had good participation in Dessert and Dialogue last week. Certainly want encourage you back. Go grab a bite to eat and come back at 1.30 in the ministry center just across the way here where we have a broader conversation around this very topic that we're going to talk about today. In worship, it's always the specific question. And then at the dessert and dialogue, it's a broader conversation around the topic itself. And thanks too for helping us select. You helped us back in June select these questions and try to pick out what it was we were going to cover. And so I'm very grateful for your participation in that and how you got us there. And a part of what all of that helps bring us together for are two rich blessings that I just want to identify for us because I think we cannot overestimate the power of these two blessings. So uh, if you'll pull out your sermon notes, uh, whether in the bulletin or on the app, I want to encourage you again our online folks to download TMUMC uh, app uh, so that you can take notes with us. But I believe our series is helping us receive two blessings. The first blessing of which is uh, we can talk about this hard stuff, all of these topics, and they're really hard for some of us. We can talk about all of these hard topics without causing harm to each one of us. And, and what a gift that is because in our culture today, I know that we're all feeling it, sometimes when we disagree on stuff, man, we cause harm whether it's verbal or emotional or sometimes even as far as physical harm, simply because we disagree about something. And a part of the gift we're trying to offer uh, ourselves is we can talk about hard stuff and not cause harm. And, and then the second is likened to it. And the, so the second blessing is quite literally this. It's possible for us to disagree on any of these four topics. We've got four of them starting last week, moving into two weeks from now. It's possible for us to disagree on any of these four topics and still be faithful to Jesus. Listen, one of our realities is this. Uh, we're not all going to land in the exact same spot with the exact same understanding about any of these topics that we're going to cover. And God is going to be all right with that. There may be one or two of us who aren't all right with that, but God is going to be all right with that. And what I would also say is no matter where we might land on these, uh, we can all still consider ourselves faithful to Christ as long as we're following his teachings, right? And so part of our goal is to recognize the gift of that. And we, we can do that as United Methodists simply because of what I refer to as the Methodist motto. Some people have assigned this motto to John Wesley, the founder of the Wesleyan movement, and he clearly was an advocate for this, but it wasn't original with him. It went all the way back to Augustine in the third century. And, and that motto is this. It's printed in your guide or in the notes, and it's simply this, that in the essentials, we need to have unity. Uh, the essentials are what we consider at the core. Now, if you were with us way back in January, you may recall we had a worship series called At the Core. And in that worship series, we covered the spiritual topics of Christianity that are at the core of the faith. You just proclaimed them with the Apostles' Creed. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the church? What does judgment look like? All of those are at the core. We've got to have unity at the core. Uh, the second is also true, though, and that is this. On the non-essentials, those things that are outside of the core, they're not unimportant, but they're not at the core. We need to have liberty. That is to say, uh, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of ways to sort of acknowledge we're not all going to land in the exact same spot, and we need to be all right with that because it's not at the core. But in all things, Wesley would say, and certainly St. Augustine would say, in all things we need to have charity. And charity, of course, is just an old-fashioned word for love. We've got to be able to find ways to love each other even when we're not on the same page theologically. We do this all the time with our family. We do this all the time in our small groups. We, we do it all the time in certain components of our life, and yet sometimes we find it hard on specific topics, right? So part of our goal in the Off Limits series was to acknowledge Unity in the essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, but in everything, love, charity. So today we're going to talk about a kind of hard topic. In fact, uh, we're going to go to hell today. Are you ready? We're going to talk about hell in the United Methodist Church. Can you believe it? 
man, I've been preaching for 25 years and I've never preached this very sermon. I've never preached on this topic like we're going to preach on it today. And so we're going to talk about hell and it's going to be hard and it's going to be awkward. And there's going to be some different thoughts around this and I, I hope we'll recognize that uh, we're not all going to land in the same place. Part of what we recognize is there's a specific question we're going to try to identify today. It's written at the top of your notes. It's on the screen. And the specific question we're going to try to address today is this. Can we claim to serve a merciful, just-filled God if God allows good people to spend eternity in hell just because they don't believe in Jesus? Now, that's a big old question, isn't it? And a part of what we've got to recognize is there's actually a whole bunch of topics crammed into that one question. There, there's the topic of, of hell, clearly, but there's also the topic of mercy and God's mercy. There's also the topic of justice and the ways in which God is just. There's topic of eternity. There's top, the topic of judgment. There's the topic of salvation. There's all kinds of stuff, and I just need for us to own that I can't address all of that. And, and, unless you want to stay till 2.30 or 3.30. Is that all right? What are you laughing at? So we just can't cover all that. So I, I want to ask us to make a, a, a grand assumption. And that grand assumption is this. We're going to address hell. Uh, we're going to address it straight on. And we're going to make some assumptions with regard to the question. And the first assumption is this, and I hope that you'll agree, that we do serve a merciful, just-filled God. I believe to the core of my belly with all that I have that the God we serve is just and merciful. And that that God is just and merciful, not just for those of us who claim faith in Jesus, but that that same God is just and merciful for all of God's creation. And that that justice and that that mercy is applicable to everybody, whether they claim faith in Jesus or not. The second is this. I make the assumption that we believe in hell. I do. I believe in hell. I believe it's real. And I believe it has consequences. And, but I'm going to say that we may not all land in the same place about what those consequences are or what hell is. But I believe it's real. And I believe that it's applicable. And I believe that we need to talk about it. So that's why we're going to talk about it today and the ways in which it, it relates to the question about a just, merciful God and these eternal consequences that we try to understand. So you ready? Let's try to do this, right? I'm also convinced that this question is, uh, uh, comes out of a Scripture passage that some of us are familiar with. In fact, if we've been to a funeral, most of us have heard this particular Scripture passage. So I'm going to also say this, that when I read the Scripture passage, some of you will recall it, some of, it, of you it may not be familiar with, but it's going to say something that will become the foundation upon which we will address the question. Okay? Fair enough? So, uh, John chapter 14. The Gospel of John is a powerful gospel like all of them, but John has his own take, right? And he has a phenomenal way to help us better encounter Jesus and that relationship that we have with Jesus. And here in John chapter 14, Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. He's, he's called them to servanthood and that we are to love one another just as he has loved us. And, and he's washed their feet. And now he's giving what uh, scholars refer to as his last discourse. He, he's going to try to set the disciples up for success at his departure. He's about to leave their physical presence and he wants them to know how they can face the future unafraid and the ways in which he's going to be present for them and with them, right? So here's what we find in John chapter 14. Jesus speaks these words. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me wherever I am. And you know the way where I'm going. <laughs> uh, no, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Well, this, we're not done yet, but um, this question by Thomas is very provocative and it stands in the grand tradition of John's recording of Jesus' teachings, ministry, and life. Here's what I mean. 
Thomas is clearly very concerned about the physicality of where Jesus is going, right? In fact, he, he in modern day times would say, Jesus, can, just give me the GPS. I want to know where you're going. I don't know. You say you're going somewhere and I don't know where you're going. So help me understand, right? He'd say, show me the GPS. Where on my phone does it say you're going, right? And this stands in a long lineage in the Gospel of John where people are concerned about the tangible, physical aspects of Jesus. Go back with me to John chapter 3. Nicodemus asked this question, how can a woman, how can a baby be born a second time? He's all wrapped up in the biology, right? Jesus says you've got to be born a nothing. You've got to be born from above. The woman at the well, John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus says he's got all kinds of water for her and she's at the well and she's going, w where are you getting this water? I don't get it. I don't understand. And she's all wrapped up in the physicality, right? John chapter 6, there's 5,000 people who need to be fed. The disciples don't understand. You've only got a few fish and loaves. How are you going to feed all 5,000 of these people, Jesus? And we're all wrapped up in the physical and the tangible. John chapter 9, there's a boy who's born blind and everybody wonders, how is he born blind? Why is he born blind? And Jesus simply says something fascinating. You see, there's a pattern here. There's something about the physicality that we all want to have the answer to. But Jesus, every single time, without exception, he makes it a spiritual practice, right? You've got to be born again. I am the living water. I am the bread of life. This man was born blind that God's glory might be revealed, right? And then he has his response to Thomas. No, Jesus, I don't know where you're going. How can I know the way? Verse 6, Jesus is going to have a response that will be both a huge blessing and deeply provocative to who we are. Jesus told him, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am that way. I am that truth. I am that life that you are looking for, Thomas. No one can come to the Father except through me. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's that last verse that we get hung up on, right? It's that last phrase of verse 6 that some of us think to ourselves and some of us actually verbalize aloud, how can that be? I've got a friend who's an atheist, or I've got a friend who's not a follower of Jesus, or I've got a friend who's a Buddhist, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, or a Jew, and what's going to happen to them? And here's all I want to say about that. Jesus is wrapped up in life, not death. It would be the theme of John's gospel, in fact, on several occasions, Jesus, John's gospel is actually referred to as the gospel of life. He's trying to help us recognize that in and through Jesus, not only is Jesus God, but Jesus is life. From the very beginning, look at John chapter 1, verse 4. He talks about in him, meaning Jesus, in him is life. And the life is the light of the world. Life for everybody. You get to John chapter 10, and we've got that most provocative of phrases that Jesus shares that we need to claim. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, Jesus said, so that you might have life, and not just any life, but abundant life, rich, full, glorious life. You see, John is trying to help us understand that Jesus came to bring life. And so when Jesus says to Thomas and to the other 11 and to you and me, you know where I'm going? I'm going to prepare something for you. And we start putting in our heads a physical place. He talks about a home. Some translations refer to that as dwelling place. He talks about going and coming. And I want to suggest there might be an alternative way to understand what Jesus is talking here about rather than merely a physical home or a tangible place. Because what I believe this is talking about is the kingdom of God. And that in the kingdom of God, there is a glorious mansion full of rooms for lots of people so that they too might know who is the way and the truth and the life. And when I return, Jesus says, you and I might want to consider that as his second coming. When he comes back and we're ready for him to come back, we get to join with him in helping build this kingdom that has many rooms, many opportunities, many possibilities for folks to join in. 
And so when he then says, you know where I'm going, you know what I'm doing, and Thomas is wrapped up in the physical, Jesus' profound response is a glorious statement of faith. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to experience the Father except through me. Now, again, when we hear that, we begin to connect some dots that I don't believe are there. But let me try to get us there real quick. I believe Jesus is done when he says that. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I pray you believe Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And no one gets to experience God except through him. And Jesus is done. There is no condemnation for those who don't know Jesus. There is no, you're going to a special place reserved for eternal uh, damnation if you don't claim this. It's merely, I want you to know this good news, friends. I want you to know that I'm the way to the Father. I want you to know that there's glorious abundance and glorious life, and I want you to celebrate this fact, and the only way you're going to get to celebrate this fact is if you know that I am the truth and the way and the life. Now, look, this is clearly not on the same vein, but this would be somewhat attuned to uh, someone who is an alum of Texas A&M saying, you know, the only way you're going to make it to the championship is through us, and thinking that everybody else is going to hell because they didn't go through A&M. Now, you Aggies, do you really believe that? Uh, There's one in every service, every service right? My, my point is simply this. My point is simply this. Jesus is done when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You only get to the Father through me. He did not go on to say, there's an eternal condemnation for those who don't know me. He didn't say that. In fact, I don't know where he says that, but he says a lot of other things that are about the power of life, and the power of overcoming death, and the power of resurrection, and the good news of everlasting life. He says all of those things, and in part, I believe what he's trying to communicate here is that I want others to know this joy as well. But we, over the centuries, have connected some dots that personally I'm not convinced are there. And they start with this question. Well, if indeed that's true, that nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, which I believe, then what does that mean? And you start, and we go down the trail, right? What does that mean for those who don't know Jesus? And for those who don't know Jesus, what does that mean for their eternal destiny? And for those who have this eternal destiny, what does that destiny look like? And we start going down this rabbit trail, right? We we literally walk down a rabbit trail that Jesus had no intention of proclaiming. What he proclaimed was, I am the way and the truth and the life. And I want you to know the Father by knowing me. But we started at some point in our rational minds wondering, what does that mean for everybody else? Nothing wrong with the question. Nothing wrong with the wondering. But I want to suggest that that's not where God is taking us, but God is taking us to a grander, glorious vision of what it means to be either a person of faith or one who has the capacity to become a person of faith because a person of faith wants that other person to become a person of faith. So let's backtrack a little. I want to see if I can connect a few dots that I think got us to where some of us might be and where I hope we can all get, okay? So there in your notes, we're going to start way back in Hebrew Scripture, and we're going to go to some words that have over the centuries begun to be sort of migrated into where some of us find ourselves, and I want to challenge us to not go there. So let's start in Hebrew Scripture in the very beginning, in in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, even in some of the early history writings, there was no concept of condemnation and death. There was just death. We died and we were done. 
And the word that was used there in the Hebrew, by the way, uh, most of us read English Bibles, right? Does anybody here read other than English Bibles? Here's one, okay. The English Bible comes to us from the original languages, right? And the original language of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, is Hebrew. And the original language of the Christian Scriptures, the New Testament, is Greek. And, 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 and we all know that sometimes when we translate, sometimes we lose and sometimes we gain when we translate. And I believe that's in part what's going on. So there's a Hebrew word in the Scriptures that goes way back into the early Scriptures and the early time of the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, that The word is sheol. The Hebrew word sheol uh, has no sense of judgment, no sense of condemnation with regard to death. In fact, the Hebrew word sheol simply means the place of death. When you die, you're in sheol. It could be rendered as grave. It could be rendered as death. It just means when you die, you die and and you go to sheol. There there is no concept of condemnation or judgment. A, A couple of examples. We go to the Proverbs, the great wisdom writers, and, and we see in Proverbs, and by the way, this particular chapter in Proverbs is talking about an immoral woman, and an immoral woman's going to lead you down the primrose path, right? In fact, here's how it's described. Her house is the way to Sheol. That is to say, it's the way to death. You're not going to find any life there. It's the way to the grave. You're not going to find any hope there, any gain there. You don't want to be around the, a woman of immoral repute. It's just acknowledging pure fact. There's no life there. There's only death. Then we get to Isaiah the prophet, and this is getting closer, but not fully to the point where Hebrews are beginning to acknowledge, you know, if you follow God in a righteous way, you're going to have a a righteous afterlife. But if you don't, you're going to have a condemnation. So we're beginning to get there, but we're not there yet. And this word sheol never takes on that connotation. But in Isaiah chapter 7, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as sheol. Let it be as deep as the grave, or let it be as deep as death, or as high as heaven. Let, let it just a- ask away and seek the sign, right? That's Sheol. In the New Testament, we have a Greek word that means the exact same thing, but that Greek word sometimes gets rendered as hell. But it's not. That Greek word in your notes is Hades. Hades is a common word. In fact, we sometimes use the word Hades as the nice way to say hell, right? You're, you're going to Hades, right? By the way, can I just own something? You know, as your pastor, I just want to be transparent. Do you know how freeing it is for me to just say a word that I'm not supposed to say in church? You know, H-E double hockey sticks. Hades means the exact same thing as Sheol. There is no judgment there. There is no, it just means the place of death. That's what it literally means. And so where we see this in the New Testament scriptures, that's literally what it means. It, there's not a condemnation or an eternal damnation here. There's just, this is the place of death. And it's some relatively familiar texts. Look at Matthew chapter 16, for instance. In Matthew chapter 16, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of death or the gates of the grave will not prevail against it. And Jesus is very clear. He has come to bring life. He has come to conquer death. He has come to overcome that sting. And all he's saying here is, Peter's going to perpetuate that. Peter's going to help you to know that death will never be the end. We believe that, right? We believe in resurrection. We believe in new life. We believe that life in Jesus conquers death, right? That's Hades. Even in the book of Revelation, and who doesn't like the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is portraying what it means for uh, the kingdom to come, and he's laying out the path, and John's writing it down. He says, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades, the grave, and I will overcome it, is his point. It will no longer be so. I have the capacity for death, and I have the capacity for life. And guess what I choose, Jesus says? I choose life. It's at this point that we begin to get into some language that connects these dots from John chapter 14, verse 6. Because now we know Sheol and Hades, they're just generic. But then we've got to deal with the word hell. Because the word hell actually exists in the New Testament. In fact, it exists 12 times. The literal word hell exists 12 times and only 12 times. It's repeated in a couple of the Gospels. But did you know that in 11 of those 12 times, it comes right out of the mouth of Jesus? Well, 
So part of what we need to go, okay, well, that's, that's serious then, right? I mean, if it, if it occurs 12 times and 11 of those come right out of the mouth of Jesus, I better pay attention. This is important stuff. This is meaningful stuff, and I better know what Jesus means when he talks about hell because that means it's real. Hello. Jesus uses the Greek word Gehenna every time. And Gehenna is a Greek word that means an actual physical place. It's right outside the gates of Jerusalem. Gehenna literally means the Valley of Hinnom. It's right next to the Kidron Valley, and, and that's a very well-known place. In fact, it looks just like this, if you'll put it up on the screen. That's the Valley of Hinnom. That's Gehenna, and that's the place Jesus, I'm convinced it doesn't say this in Scripture, but I think he's pointing every time he says it. You know that place. It's a horrible place. It's quite literally a God-forsaken place. You know what happened in the Valley of Hinnom? Back in the day, long time ago, centuries before Jesus, some of the pagan religions would sacrifice their kids right down in that valley. God forsaken. And because of that horrible atrocity, as the Hebrews continued to grow and thrive and prosper there, they began to make that the dump because nobody ought to live there, nothing ought to reside there, nothing good could possibly take place there because of all this sacrificial worship that took place there. So they begin to pile their trash, their waste. And you know in the back country and where, where we don't have uh, adequate dumps, what do you do with your trash as it begins to pile up? You begin to burn it. And so there in Gehenna, in the valley of Hinnom, uh, there's smoke that arises from time to time, and, and there's a horrible smell from time to time because it's got all kinds of trash. In fact, every once in a while, the Hebrews would actually, and the Romans would actually, kill people right there in Hinnom because that's where bad stuff happens. And so when Jesus uses the Greek word Gehenna, that we render hell, he's talking about a real place, y'all. It's physical, it's tangible, and everybody there knows where it is and knows what happens there and knows the potential of that place there. Now put that in your hat just for a second and then consider this that's in your notes. Every time Jesus uses the word hell, Gehenna, every time, you go read it, most of them are listed in your notes today, Every time he uses it, he's speaking to the religiously committed. Sometimes it's the disciples, and sometimes it's the Pharisees. But nonetheless, it's people who are in the game, who've already committed, who are following either Jesus or the Jewish tradition. He's talking to the religiously committed, and he's basically saying, if you don't get your poo together, and that's a Greek word, If you don't do right, if you don't follow well, if you don't acknowledge my teachings, then you're going to Gehenna. And I'm convinced, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm convinced he's pointing right over there and saying, that's what it's like. That's what your life will be like. That's where you're going. That's the consequence. Let's look at a couple of them. So in Matthew chapter 5, it's the, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's talking to some of his closest friends, uh, some of the folks he wants to follow him very closely and very dearly, and he's giving them instruction. We actually read from these two scriptures last week. You remember about plucking your eye out and cutting your hand off? That's these two scriptures. Matthew 5, verse 29. After you pluck your eye out, it's better for you to lose one of your members than to take the whole body and throw it into Gehenna. Right over there, brothers. Verse 30, it's better for you to cut off your hand than for, and to lose one member than to have uh, your whole member uh, go into Gehenna. And so what he's saying to those disciples is, follow my teachings, live my love, offer forgiveness. You remember this, the Beatitudes? He's just finished talking about the Beatitudes. Be that blessed person. And if you can't be that blessed person, you're going to go reside in Gehenna. You begin to get the picture that Jesus is talking to those who believe and the consequences for those who don't follow what they believe rather than the consequences of not believing at all. Look at Matthew chapter 23. He's talking to the Pharisees. You know, Jesus loves the Pharisees. And whenever he talks to the Pharisees, he uses calm, uh, serene language like he does here in verse tw chapter 20. You snakes! 
you brood of vipers. <laughs> How can you escape being sentenced to Gehenna? Now, they're not followers of Jesus, but they're followers of the law, and they're followers who know the law tremendously well. And he's simply pointing out to them that if they stop following that, if they stop rendering others in the wrong way, then they too will go to Gehenna. Well, it begins to get at my point that Jesus is trying to help us see that the consequences of hell are actually for those who are unrepentant in their faith. For those of us who already have said, I believe in the way and the truth and the life, but I'm not living the way or the truth or the life, and therefore my consequence is hell. He, Jesus said nothing about those who don't claim that faith, those who aren't willing to step into it, those who haven't yet stepped into it. Jesus didn't address that. What he addressed is for those who believe he is the way, the truth, and the life and what they can have. And so as your notes indicate, uh, Jesus is saying to us that hell is reserved for believers who either cause or allow injustices to happen. Hello. That puts a pretty big burden on us that if indeed we believe Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, how is it that we are living the way and the truth and the life? And how is it that we're helping others to claim that? Because here's the reality, friends. I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe he is the way and the truth and the life. But I don't want to tell somebody else to follow Jesus. I don't want to invite somebody else to follow Jesus so that they can avoid hell. I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to invite people into a relationship with Jesus so that they can know the way and the truth and the life, so that they can have this abundant life that Jesus offered, so that they can have everlasting life. Think about it just on a superficial human level. What motivates us more when somebody's trying to sell us something, invite us into something, or be a part of something? Guilt? Shame? Eternal condemnation? Or joy and life? Mercy? Justice? Forgiveness? Salvation? We need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to be inviting people to experience who he is and what he's about. But we need to do it out of the motivation of who he is rather than what might be, rather than what could happen. In essence, Jesus is saying in chapter 14, verse 6, I don't want you to miss out, friends. I, I don't want you to miss this opportunity, friends. I don't want for you to take one more day of life and live it in death. I want you to have life and truth and the way. It's fascinating when we think about it. The most commonly understood and quoted and shared scripture in all of Christianity comes from this gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16, right? Uh, we can all probably quote it. I'll put it on the screen. You know, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, right? That whoever believes in him may not be lost. Some say perish, right? Some say get lost, um, but rather have life. What we tend to forget is the very next verse, which is all about what we're talking about here today. Verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to judge the world guilty, but rather to save the world through him. So my invitation to myself and to us is to stop sort of putting yourself through the ringers because you feel obligated to determine who is going to hell and who is not but rather spend time and energy and effort and faith 
determining how it is I'm going to stop injustice and how it is I'm going to demonstrate God's mercy and how it is I'm going to live God's joy and how it is I can point people to the way and the truth and the life and how it is I can help people discover that abundance and how it is I can point people to the North Star and how it is I can help people experience life in Christ because nobody understands the Father unless they understand Jesus. May it be our goal to help people understand Jesus rather than some eternal condemnation that we haven't a clue about. I pray, certainly for me, and also for us, that we will do the right thing so that we won't find ourselves in Gehenna. I pray it's not going to happen for me. I pray it's not going to happen for you. But let's spend our energy and effort making sure because the kingdom of God is worth that. And it's worth building the powerful possibility that others could make it true too. Thanks be to God that we have that opportunity. Will you pray with me? Holy and blessed God, thank you. Thank you that you give us life and you show us the way and you give us the truth in Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've helped us to better understand uh, what hell is and how it is uh, we can avoid it and how it is, God, we can point others to Jesus. Claim for us the higher road. Give courage to us to stop pointing fingers and rather claiming lives for the way and the truth and the life. Jesus, the Word made flesh. God, thank you for the powerful possibilities of abundant life. May it be true for us and may we give it away to others. In the name of Jesus, the way and the truth and the life we pray. Amen.